Mark is a digital strategy advisor with Live. I'm very, very excited to have him join us today for a presentation on generative AI and research in healthcare. Join me in welcoming Mark. Hi. Hey. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, interesting. My talk's going to be a little bit different, I think. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not an academic, I'm not a researcher. Um, but I do work with a lot of universities, and I work with a lot of researchers, and I spend a lot of time thinking about uh, digital technologies, how they're going to impact our commu like organizations, communities, our society at, at whole. And as a result, um, often I can sort of overcomplicate things a bit. I, um, you know, a little while ago I was asked to do a talk on, on generative AI, so you know, this kind of new version of AI that we're it's kind of in the media a lot at the moment. And um, I was asked to you know, sort of talk about, you know, how is this going to impact our society? And I was walking around my house thinking about generative AI. I was thinking about you know, artificial intelligence. And, and you know, I was coming up with big ideas about how it was actually going to impact our, our society. And then I walked into my son's bedroom. Now, my son is he's a bit he's a, you know, on the autis um, autism spectrum. And he gets quite obsessed about things sometimes. And, I walked into his room and he started speaking Russian at me. And I said, I said, now he's nine years old and that was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, and, and I said, are you, learning, are you learning Russian at school? And he said, no, no, I'm not. Um, and I said, well, what's, what's going on? Um, and he showed me this. So he'd, he'd opened up my instance of chat GDP and with you know, a couple of sentences had created his own digital assistant, basically saying, you are, as Jack TB, you're going to act as a Russian teacher. I'm a nine-year-old child, and I want you to teach me how to speak Russian. And then he was taking elements of that and putting it into, into Google Translate and learning how to say it. And there was where I realized what was actually happening. Within the few sentences, he had created a digital assistant told him who he was in some of the context and it got that digital assistant to take him through a process so he could learn and sort through complex information really, really quickly. Um, and I think that's a lot about what we're talking about here with generative AI and how it could impact this community. As I said, uh, you know, my, that's, that's me, um, you know, I, I, I teach digital transformation as part of Executive MBA. I, I'm CEO of Alive. Um, I sit on several boards and I'm invested in AI startups and I've written lots of articles on, you know, on this sort of stuff. And, and it, it's, you know, this is, I've seen lots of sort of technology, you know, sort of uh, bubbles. We're probably in one of those right now, obviously, with AI. But the one thing that I find interesting is, you know, these kinds of quotes. Now, this, you know, this was Justin Trudeau back in um, 2018 saying the pace of change has never been this fast and it will never be this slow again. And, and versions of this quote can be traced back all the way to kind of Aristotle, really. Um, but what's super interesting about the current phase that we're in right now um, is, yes, it's fast, but we're also getting that, that, that super fast reaction where we're getting a lot of society going, oh, look, doomsday, it's all going to be, you know, it's going to be evil and this, this technology is going to scare us and all those kinds of things. But as we know, every time we do have a leap forward in technology, the net result is predominantly positive. So let's have a think about what that could actually mean. Um, and, and the fact that we're going through an economic cycle, you know, the downturn economic cycle often is a catalyst for these new technologies to actually have a really big positive impact. Now, generative AI, this, ca this category of, of AI that we're you know, talking about right now, it's currently being used for a lot of different things in the medical, medical sphere. Um, <clears throat> So it's currently being used for medical simulations. It's being used for drug discovery, so it can actually you know, generate new drugs, new molecules, and so on, and test them out um, very, very quickly. Um, obviously, medical chatbots, um, so we can have you know, so people involved in the community can have can have personalised discussions, um, improving medical imaging, um, and assisting with medical research itself. And generative AI can actually have a big impact on the research community broadly, um, improving and customising patient care, uh, and then then they're sort of you know, the, actually helping with diagnoses, 
um, and then of course from that point on creating personalised treatment plans. Now, those are lots of different things that are all sort of coming together to go, well, what, is, what could that look like? One of the companies I'm invested in is um, a company called Mesh AI. And when COVID hit, um, you know, there was obviously a lot of people going into lockdown and, and we went through a process of going this, we, we, the business had created a, a conversational AI to guide complex journeys. And it was originally thought about for um, purchasing journeys, things like, you know, buying a house and, you know, buying education, buying a car, those kinds of things. We are a complex journey where you want to get lots and lots of information and have a personalised outcome. We sat down with the CEO and then um, the rest of the, the rest of the executive of that business and said, could we take that language model that you've created and apply it to psychological health? Because there's going to be lots of people sitting at home, they're going to be working alone, um, we probably need to think about ways that we can support that. Um, so we work with a bunch of clinical psychologists, um, some researchers at universities, and we created something called Sympatico, um, which is what, what is actually happening there. So what we started thinking is, well, the vast majority in the psychological health area, the vast majority of resources are at crisis point because that's usually when people ask for help. If we could actually create a psychological chatbot that understood who the, who the person was, understood the context, could speak their language, and never forgot anything that was ever said, we could start to create feedback loops with inside of that. And if we have the right feedback loop at the right time, what that means is we can start to smooth out the demand curve. So people are able to, to seek support and help sooner. And that's exactly what, what the guys created. Got it to a point now where Microsoft has invested in that um, and there's, you know, we're going to be rolling it out through Microsoft Teams. And fundamentally, that's what it's about. It's got about 160 different points of self-diagnosis in there, so not clinical diagnosis, but, but a feedback loop helping people understand when they're entering into a period of, of you know, psychological issue of some description and helping them seek appropriate help sooner, hopefully smoothing out that demand curve. And so what does that mean within this context, within, you know, prior to Willie? Well, we started looking at, um, you know, how we can, how we can actually start to look through documents and guide and move through how documents are going to be used. So as a very initial stage, we can upload huge numbers of documents, research documents, whatever is available, understand who the person is at the other end, and then allow them to be able to search through the, that information, understand where it came from, understand the context, and then be able to get that information. So rather than being a big repository that they have to sort through themselves, it does that work for them. Where could this go? Now, I think this is the where that's really interesting, because a lot of what we were talking about, you know, we've heard talking about today is, is how do people get access to the right information? How do the different members of the community all participate in a, in a way that's, that's, that actually helps? How, do they, how does the information that's, that everybody get the right information out of a system and put information back into that system? That's where, going back to what my son did, here's my context, here's who I am, here's what I want to get out of this, so, you know, if you're a parent, my context is my parent, here's, the, here's, the, here's what my child is, I want to be able to understand and guide my, my child through this, this situation. Or I'm a researcher, you know, I'm, I'm much more on, the, on actually generating information and feeding that back into systems and making sure it's getting validated and, and so on. So whoever you are within inside the community, the digital assistant sitting next to you knows who you are, knows your context, knows how to speak your language, and can help you through that process of making sure the right information is getting into the system at the right time. Doing things like as we just heard before, if you have to write a, an application to NDIS, for example, this could do it for you. And I, and, I, and I sort of say, that sort of sounds a little bit far off, but I can tell you right now, Department of Education in New South Wales have created digital assistance using this exact technology for teachers and for students. They're designing, not for the middle, not for the vast majority, but for people right on the edge. So people in regional communities and different, different languages, they're using the kind of extreme cases to make this work. 
And what they've what they've done is actually gone well. There's, there's a demo of a teacher saying, "I need to design a new learning plan." The digital assistant's brainstorming with with the teacher, making sure the learning plan is created. Then goes, "Okay, would you like to design a rubric for that?" "Yeah, absolutely." It goes through that process. It is able to build out the rubric. Oh, now that we've finished that, would you like me to apply that rubric to the student's digital assistant? Yep. That's able to happen immediately. The student gets an update saying, hey, there's an update to the way that, the way that this part of your learning is going to be marked. The student goes, great, well, I'm working on an assignment right now. Could you give me some feedback? You can just apply that immediately. You know, puts their, their file into it. Digital assistant is able to read that assignment, come back to them and say, here are some areas that you're doing really well. Here are some areas that you probably need some improvement. Get early stage feedback happening immediately. And of course, the administrators who are looking at all of this information are understanding where different groups of students are struggling in different areas and what parts of that, that system need to be changed or updated. And so that whole system is actually starting to work together because everybody has got a digital assistant sitting next to them that actually helps their job become more efficient, but make sure all the information is actually working together in a, in a you know, in a way that, that is actually helpful. So I kind of think that's, that's, you know, that's a lot of what I do, um, and you know, I'm honoured to be here today. As I said, you know, and my role is to think about how this technology impacts what we do, and you know, as I say to my my team, we actually we sort of brand it. We call it humankind technology. We have a responsibility to make sure that the technologies that are developed have a really positive impact on society and on communities, and you know, this is a perfect example of where that can happen. Thank you very much.